which I suppose means I'm the resident loudmouth. Pretty much. Ali, as most of you know very well, is an organization of women and men which is nonpartisan but political, and I'll explain that later. The League encourages informed, active participation in government, and active participation of government starts with voting. You can go as far as you want from there. You can run for office. You can join municipal government, but it all starts with casting your vote. The League works to increase understanding of major policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. And we're committed in policy and in practice to equity, diversity, and inclusion. All community members starting at age 16 are welcome to join the League. Now getting back to this business of nonpartisanship and political uh, activism, we're nonpartisan in the sense that the League of Women Voters is an organization never supports a candidate or a party. We're partisan in that after we investigate an issue, discuss it, and reach a consensus, we then do advocate for a point of view. We're committed, as I said, in policy and practice to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I hope that you will go about your business letting other members of the community know about this. One of the League's major positions is to protect the right of all citizens to vote and to encourage all citizens to vote. That right, a hallmark of democracy, is under attack today. And that's one of the reasons for Jane's talk, because there's a case coming before the Supreme Court that could have a major impact on how we vote in, in 2024. You all know our guest speaker, Dr. Jane Scarborough. We all call her Jane, and I have your permission to do that, right? Absolutely. I'm going to put that <laughs> holds a PhD in American Constitutional History from Rice University, and she knows more than a thing or two about how well or poorly the U.S. Supreme Court has protected the right of every citizen to vote. I'm going to give you a sampling from Jane's biography so you can get a sense of the scope and depth of her knowledge of American Constitutional History. A sample. Just a sample. I, mean, I have the longer version, which I will read to you outside the library after 8.30. Jane, uh, after getting her PhD, initially taught in some of the, the nation's uh, most desirable private schools in Pittsburgh and in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. But at the age of 40, she uh, was struck with an affliction. She decided to go to law school. <laughs> After graduating from Northeastern School of Law, she briefly practiced law and security law, corporate law and securities law, at a very tony New York City firm of 300 members. And their uh, hourly rate reads like a zip code. <laughs> In 1991, she had enough of that kind of private practice, and she became Associate Dean of Students at the law school. And from there, she became Northeastern University's first woman vice president, and headed Northeastern's signature cooperative education program for all of its schools and colleges. Jane returned to the law faculty in 1995 as a full-time member of the faculty teaching constitutional law, securities law, gender, sexuality in the law, and legal ethics. And she puts, she herself puts in parenthesis next to legal ethics, which some say is an oxymoron. <laughs> Since retiring in 2002, Jane has taught literally dozens of courses in constitutional history and law all over the Boston area, and fortunately for her, 
for us, I should say, not for her, because it's a nice place to live. It is. She's settled on the Cape and has taught a number of courses on constitutional history and law through the Academy of Lifelong Learning of, of Cape Cod and through the sponsorship of the Mashpee Public Library. So this gives you an idea of Jane's preparedness and understanding in the realm of constitutional law. All of you have received a handout, I hope, which uh, quote gives you excerpts from the United States Constitution which deal with voting. They're not the only excerpt, excerpts that would, but in any event, these are the passages which Jane is going to uh, concentrate on when she discusses this upcoming case Holmes versus Moore. This case is going to be argued before the Supreme Court in this new term, anytime from October through June. We don't know what the court is going to decide, but three of the eminent justices have already said they've made up their mind. They haven't heard an oral argument. They haven't sat down to discuss their views and to try to reconcile them, but they have a decision already. You're taking all my cookies. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Heavens. Before we give Jane a, ch a chance to interject, I just want to recognize people who have made this program a reality. We have uh, Olivia White and Terry White, Olive Ann Hobby, and Lynn Rosia. They've, they've really been a great help. Bob Fenstermaker, Director of Operations of FCTV, and Chris Smallis, our uh, videographer tonight, are making it possible to share this program with the community and the library staff most notably Phoebe Atchison, who's the acting director while Linda Collins is on vacation, and Peter Cook, the IT director, have really made it possible for us to sit in, com in comfort here and to uh, learn more about a very important subject. Now, finally, I will step back and let Jane do the rest. get wired for sound. How is that? Or do I need it louder? Louder. It louder? I never understood why people wore their glasses like this. But I had cataract surgery a few weeks ago, and now I can see perfectly distance, which I never could since age six. But I can't see anything up close. <laughs> so I've got my CVS peepers here, magnifying glasses, because I don't yet have my prescription. <coughs> On this beautiful Cape evening, I know you could have been sitting on your deck watching the sunset with a gin and tonic. <laughs> so I'm grateful that the loyal group is here alongside of a few newcomers. Um, my preliminary remarks, I plan to be um, 
about 35 plus minutes, leaving plenty of time for the Q&A. Just remember, though, that it's Q&A, it's not S&A. If they meant speech and answers, they would be S&A. It's Q&A, so you have to come up with the question. <clears throat> we have to be out of here by 8.30, so that's one of the reasons that we're meeting as early as we are, and I will try to get us to the Q&A within plenty of time for you to express your thoughts and questions. Question, not thoughts. <laughs> actually, actually, Sylvia, if I'm supposed to talk about Holmes v. Moore, I think you've got the wrong person. It's Moore v. Harper. <laughs> when you said that, I thought, wait a minute. That isn't what I'm planning to talk about, but anyway. Okay. That's one of the first times I've ever been able to correct Sylvia. She's usually correcting me. All right. Let's get going without any further cracks. Is the Supreme Court on a collision course with democracy? I won't keep you in suspense. My answer to the question is yes. I believe the third branch of our government poses a threat to our democracy. The branch that was famously described by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison as the weakest branch during the ratification debates, the branch that our most famous Chief Justice John Marshall had to explain its job, quote, to be the providence and duty of the court to say what the law is, the branch that didn't even have its own building in which to hold court until 1935. How did that branch become so powerful? I think there would be little or no argument today that the Supreme Court has at least as much power as the other two branches of government. I would argue they have more power because for all intents and purposes, the justices are there permanently unlike the tenure of elected members of the other two branches. As the justices have long admitted, the power of their rulings comes from the court's legitimacy. With no military to enforce its judgments, the court depends upon the persuasiveness of its decisions under the law, not so much for the rulings that the public generally supports, but for its unpopular rulings. After the consequential term that concluded in June with highly unpopular rulings on abortion and gun safety laws, among others, the Supreme Court opens its new term in two weeks with its lowest public approval and confidence ratings in decades. Some are already predicting quote, another monster term, end quote, with a docket that has advocates of voting rights, racial justice, and thus democracy on high alert. The new term also welcomes a new justice, Katanya Brown Jackson, the first black female and the first former public defender on the Supreme Court. There's a seat down here, Carol. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> On the eve of his retirement in 1991, the nation's first black justice, Thurgood Marshall, took a moment to denounce the Supreme Court over its, quote, radical path of abandoning past precedents. Power, not reason, Marshall said, is the new currency of this court's decision making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Three decades later, the New York Times court reporter emeritus, as I like to call her, Linda Greenhouse, writing about the court's reasoning in the Dobbs decision, echoed Marshall's words. In explaining their decision, she said, they, the court, they did it 
because they could. It was as simple as that, end quote. Power, not reason, just as Marshall had said. Justices Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan wrote in their joint dissent, quote, neither law nor facts nor attitudes have provided any new reasons to reach a different result than Roe and Casey did. All that has changed is this court. Hmm. Ruth Marcus of the Washington Post was one of the first to write an opinion piece on the power of a Supreme Court with a six justice conservative bench. In her essay entitled The Rule, the Rule of Six, a newly radicalized Supreme Court is poised to reshape the nation. Marcus described the difference in a court having six conservatives versus five. Quote, a five justice majority, she wrote, is inherently fragile. It necessitates compromise and discourages overreach. Five justices tend to proceed with baby steps whereas a six-justice majority is, in her words, quote, a different animal. A six-justice majority, she goes on to say, is emboldened rather than hesitant, doesn't need to trim its sails, hedge its language, or abide by legal niceties, end quote. I'm not sure what Marcus meant by legal niceties, but my guess would be niceties like precedents. <laughs> With five justices to the Chief Justice's right, the other conservatives no longer need to compromise with Roberts to win. Certainly, Justice Alito's majority opinion in Dobbs fits Marcus's description perfectly of what to expect from a six-person majority court. How does this new, quote, restless and newly constituted court, as Justice Sotomayor labeled the new majority, how does this court threaten our democracy? Well, as Sylvia said a while ago, the most basic feature of a democracy is voting rights. Yet from the beginning under the Constitution, we the people never represented an accurate reflection of all the people when it came to who had the right to vote. In 2022, however, it is illegal to deny access to the ballot box based on race, gender, or age over 18. 67% of eligible voters cast a ballot in the 2020 presidential election the highest turnout in modern history. But despite these legal milestones, or maybe because of them, in broadening voter access, today voting rights are under attack by one of the major political parties. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, this past year, legislatures in 19 states passed 34 laws imposing voting restrictions. Hmm. Nearly all these so-called reforms are acknowledged to be intended to suppress voters, particularly minority, urban minority voters. Some examples of these laws. In Florida, it is now illegal to offer water to someone standing in line to vote. Compare that with our town of Falmouth's food trucks on election days. <laughs> Georgia is allowing counties to eliminate voting on Sundays. Souls to the polls has been a Southern tradition where many blacks go to church on Sunday and then from there go in groups to vote. In 2020, Texas, this is my favorite, and that's because Texas, I don't admit it usually, but in 2020, Texas limited the number of drop-off locations to one per county, which meant 
one Texas county with 57 people had the same number of drop-off locations as Harris County, which includes Houston and has 4.7 million people. <laughs> the federal courts have had a mixed record overturning these so-called reforms. A recent example of not overturning is a per curiam or an unsigned opinion for the court in which the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed a lower federal court ruling leaving in place a provision of the 1890 Mississippi Constitution designed to keep African Americans from voting. But back in a 1964 landmark decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment requires that legislative districts are roughly equivalent in population. Then Chief Justice Earl Warren, then Chief Justice Earl Warren, wrote for the 8-1 majority an opinion that Warren always considered the finest of his tenure on the court. When I read that, I thought, well, surely, surely Brown v. Board of Education but then I remembered that was a unanimous decision by the court, so there was no majority opinion which he wrote. I felt better then. Um, but today, it is hard to find evidence that the one person, one vote is still binding precedent. As districts are drawn in such ways, gerrymandered, as to ensure safe districts for candidates of the legislative majority who's redrawing the maps. This process of redistricting is based on the decennial <coughs> census reflecting growth or loss in the various states. So the new districts, once established, are in place for 10 years. Today, with the help of computerized programs, legislatures can draw districts within one vote of favoring their party or can draw districts with, in which a majority of black voters are concentrated, leaving only a few voters of color in the other districts, or can combine two districts um, against each other, as was done recently in New York, pitting two powerful Democrats against each other. That was Terry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney. While the Supreme Court may still intervene in a redrawing of a legislative district which openly discriminates on the basis of race, for the most part, the Supreme Court has used the so-called political question doctrine to avoid redistricting <coughs> challenges and recently has explicitly held, the Supreme Court has, that the federal courts have no role in the issue of gerrymandering. The so-called political question doctrine is used by the Supreme Court when it says the issues at hand are purely political and thus not justiciable. You all know what that is. Uh, it's, a, it's a fancy legal term meaning not within the court's jurisdiction and or inappropriate for the court to hear. I'm not sure how a political question is determined these days since every decision is, to use an overused term, weaponized to attack one's political opponent. But despite the political question doctrine, the Supreme Court did grant the petition for certiorari, that is a petition requesting review by the court, in the case of Moore v. Harper. So with this, so what is this case, Moore v. Harper, about? And how does it threaten our democracy? Moore v. Harper is a case stemming from a ruling by the North Carolina Supreme Court that its state constitution prohibits extreme gerrymandering. Last year, North Carolina's Republican-dominated state legislature passed on a party-line vote 
an extreme partisan gerrymander to lock in a, a supermajority for the state's 14 congressional seats. North Carolina voters challenged this gerrymandered map, contending that it violated the state constitution's, quote, free election clause, end quote. The North Carolina Supreme Court agreed and struck down the proffered map from the North Carolina legislature and reinstated the map drawn by a special master appointed by the state Supreme Court. Unwilling to accept this result, Republican legislators asked the United States Supreme Court, through its emergency powers, to step in and reinstate their gerrymandered map. While the Supreme Court re uh, rejected the emergency appeal to put the gerrymandered map back in place immediately, four justices, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, urged the legislators to file a petition for certiorari under the usual process. Now, under the Supreme Court's rule of four, it only takes four votes that are necessary to grant a cert petition. As a result, it was not surprising then when the Supreme Court granted cert in the Moore v. Harper case on the last day of the 2021-2022 term. Why did the Supreme Court take this case? Well, the court rarely gives reasons for why the justices grant cert in any given case. However, when the four Supreme Court justices urged the legislators to file a cert petition, they did so admittedly for the purpose of having a Supreme Court ruling on the constitutionality of something called the independent state legislature theory. There's always been a theory, it's now being sometimes called a doctrine. But this theory, known by its acronym ISL, leads us directly to the discussion of what is at stake in this case. In Moore v. Harper, Republican legislative leaders asked the Supreme Court to rule that it is unconstitutional for state courts and state constitutions to protect federal voting rights. In their view, only state legislatures should be able to determine election rules absent intervention by Congress. These are federal election rules. By this logic, state legislatures could reject pers uh, presidential election results they do not like. And this is where I get to referring to your handout. I mean, I thought I was never going to, but I am. <laughs> Proponents of this view read the election clause in the U.S. Constitution to give state legislators near exclusive authority to regulate federal elections prohibiting any other state entity like courts or governors from exercising any check on the power. Their theory comes from the words in Article 1, Section 4. If you refer to the handout, you can see the exact words in the Constitution, which reads, quote, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, except as to the places of choosing senators. Now the reason for that is a little known secret. You can impress your friends at the next cocktail hour. Um, that's because senators are statewide, unlike representatives who obviously have districts. So I just wanted to make sure that in choosing the senators, you didn't kind of do what they now do in gerrymandering and put everybody in one area. So under this Article 1, Section 4, as the proponents of the ISL theory 
believe that except for U.S. congressional intervention, there is no check on a state legislature's power regarding federal elections. Then we move to Article 2, which deals with the President, the Executive Department. Article 2, <coughs> Section 1 refers to the presidential elections and says, quote, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. But no senator or representative or persons holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. Yeah. Now, in this case, the Constitution prescribes how the number of electoral votes for each state is determined. The total representation of senators in Congress uh, in Congress <coughs> equals the number of electoral votes. But it doesn't say anything about who determines and for whom and how the electoral votes will be cast. Proponents of the Independent State Legislature Theory, or ISL, interpret those words to mean that the state's legislature stands on its own and is not part of the general structure of state government for these purposes. If the Supreme Court agrees with this theory, it would be taking away the state's court, state court's jurisdiction to oversee the state legislature's interpretation and management of federal elections, and the Supreme Court would in turn be assigning the role of oversight to itself. Sneaky. Um, if this sounds familiar, think back to the 2000 presidential election between George W. Bush and Al Gore. Now, I know some of you weren't born then, but uh, before that election, the idea of the independent state legislature was just a theory that had been debunked by any serious constitutional scholar. Remember how the recount in Florida was halted. <clears throat> Under Florida election law, a machine recount of all votes cast was required when the margin of victory was less than a half percent, as it was in the 2000 election. The US Supreme Court stepped in to reverse an order by the Florida by Florida Supreme Court requiring a manual recount of all what we call undervotes resulting from you'll remember these hanging chads and the butterfly ballot design. The 5-4 reversal by the Supreme Court was based on an equal protection argument. But in a concurring opinion, then Chief Justice William Rehnquist, joined by the late Justice Antonin Scalia and by Clarence Thomas, argued that the state's highest court had effectively created a new election law, a power granted under the United States Constitution exclusively <laughs> to the state's legislature. Now this argument was an early version of the more fully developed ISL theory. One more important note about the Bush v. Gore decision was the fact that knowing it was outside of its lane, interpreting state law on a state matter, the Supreme Court added to its opinion the unprecedented statement that its decision was unique to the circumstances of Bush v. Gore and was not to be viewed as a precedent for any future case. 
The theory of ISL presented to the court in Moore v. Harper has been a recurring one in recent years, but Moore v. Harper is the first time the Supreme Court is being asked directly to opine on the theory. Now, I've made the argument for the supporters of ISL, but why do most constitutional scholars see it as a threat to democracy? As I see it, I'm a constitutional scholar, but I see it that way too. The theory runs contrary to constitutional text, history, practice, and precedent. The framers famously distrusted state lawmakers, as much so, so much so that they, when they drafted the elections clause, they insisted that Congress retain the ultimate power to set the rules for federal elections if they were unhappy with what the state was doing. State practice from the country's founding to today also refutes the theory. For example, many framers, including James Madison, voted to adapt, adopt state constitutions that regulated federal elections, as North Carolina does. In addition to this historical evidence, the ISL theory makes no sense. It would be absurd for a state legislature to be allowed to violate the very state constitution that created it. For these reasons and others, the US Supreme Court has repeatedly rejected the theory for over a century, including as recently as in 2015 and 2019. But to my mind, the strongest refutation of the ISL theory is the fact that it turns federalism, the very structural and substantive platform on which our government is based, it turns federalism on its head. A basic tenet of federalism is the concept of shared sovereignty by the state and the federal government over the same geographical area. A state's highest court has the ultimate say in the meaning of the state's constitutions, constitution and laws. <clears throat> the Supreme Court has the ultimate say in the meaning of the US Constitution and all federal laws. Only when a, quote, federal question is raised on appeal to the Supreme Court, only those cases, in those cases, does the Supreme Court have jurisdiction to decide the ultimate interpretation of both the state law or decision as well as the Supreme Court's usual final determination of the meaning of our Constitution. A federal question then is one that implicates a state Supreme Court's decision is in conflict with the US Constitution and our federal laws. So because there's a conflict between them, it becomes a federal question at the appeal to the federal court. While most of the population is unaware of Moore v. Harper or the effects of its possible implementation, constitutional scholars and court journalists have taken note and are sounding the alarm. A sample of recent titles, quote, it is hard to overstate the danger of the voting case the Supreme Court just agreed to hear. Quote, Supreme Court may hear 800-pound gorilla of election law cases. Or, the new Supreme Court case that imperils American democracy. We got the idea. War v. Harper, as described in Slate Magazine, was said, has the quote, has the potential to fundamentally rework the relationship between state legislatures and state courts in protecting voting rights in federal elections. It also could provide the path for election subversion in congressional and presidential elections. To put it simply, the independent state legislature theory 
give state legislatures the potential power to overturn the will of the voters. <coughs> Writing in Vanity Magazine, Christian Ferisa summed up my view and provided the answer to my question at the beginning. Quote, in asserting power rather than reason over what remains of our less than perfect union, the Supreme Court may well unravel democracy with it, taking us down a path from which there is no return. Thank you. to ask questions and there's we're gonna say the boot. <laughs> no, not so fast. <laughs> uh, we have a microphone which is on the left hand side as I face all of you. And if you could somehow or other make your way to the microphone or you want to pass up questions that you've written on the cards that were available to you, uh, we can begin the questioning period. No, no, right over there, there without, without exactly. Oh, right. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, I could probably hear the questions, but I think they want to make sure that they hear them on the video. So, uh, as Sylvia says, you can walk up to the microphone and ask your question. You can make your point, too, just not speak. Um, and ask your question. Um, don't be shy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, two questions. One is a mechanical question. If the next election in November produces a few more senators, that the filibuster rule could be overturned, could the Senate and for Congress then pack the Supreme Court? Okay, hang on to your second question. I probably won't remember it. You can ask it. Just no, 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 no. I'll forget it. Well, well, I'll ask it and I'll write it down. Go ahead. You know, there was so much talk about adding justices to the Supreme Court, particularly after the past president in his one term got uh, to appoint three justices to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> It should have been at best one, but under a lot of smart maneuvering on one side, it was three. However, that discussion was uh, pretty much uh, discounted and rejected by most people. And they took polls as to what do you think about the idea. Of course, we talk about it as packing the court after FDR's attempt at packing the court when all of his alphabet agency agencies um, were being uh, <clears throat> ruled unconstitutional. And so he, having been you know, over a Congress that did everything almost by voice vote that he required at the time, um, when he put forward the proposal to add justices to the court, uh, in increasing the number, um, the court got his message. And suddenly, uh, the court wasn't finding all of those agencies that came before it unconstitutional. It's always called the switch in time that saved nine. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, since this last court's term, with so many unpopular decisions and looking like they're clamoring for more in that direction, talk is heated up again and has now the approval of a majority, though a slim one, of Americans uh, with respect to adding to the Supreme Court. Now, the number of Supreme Court justices is not in the Constitution. It's varied from 
before in the early days when they had trouble finding anyone that wanted to sit on it, um, to I think at one point it was 10 or 12, and then it's been back to nine for since after the Civil War and to this day. But there's no magic in that number. Now there have been some interesting, uh, we might never get to your second question. There have been some <laughs> interesting. <laughs> uh, there's been some interesting theories that have been proposed as to how to do this. You know, President Biden, shortly after he was inaugurated, proposed a presidential commission on the Supreme Court. And it had 34 members on it, mostly academics and judges. And it did what all commissions do. It spent a long time and it came up with no real proposals. They couldn't agree on it. <coughs> the one they came closest to supporting was the idea that the Supreme Court needed a, an ethics, the rule of ethics needed to apply to the Supreme Court as well as all the other courts that it already applies to. Um, the best suggestion, I don't know if it, you would consider it the best, my own approved <laughs> proposal would be to put, um, put an age limit, like say at 75, any justice on the Supreme Court who reaches that um, <coughs> milestone is off the Supreme Court, but is still a justice in reserve. They do this on the lower courts and is there to participate when needed in cases in the appeals courts and anywhere else in the federal system they are needed. The beauty of that is, number one, that you couldn't kind of game when that 75th year was going to come when you appointed them. Also, it means that you wouldn't have to amend the Constitution because the Constitution says they are appointed for life. And so if you were going to change that, you would have to amend the Constitution. But if you didn't, if they never left the office, but just had, were in a different position, that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't run afoul of the Constitution. So that's one of the thoughts. Um, there is a lot more interest in doing so, and um, depending on what happens uh, in the midterms, um, I don't know, it may, it may become, maybe if the filibuster goes away, uh, we could get something through, but no. Well, that's yeah. actually what I was asking, okay. which is, you know, pretend that Chuck Schumer is Mitch McConnell. He wouldn't care at all about the arguments that are you so well posed, I think. He would use raw power to achieve the packing of, or the increasing of the justices. And my question was, is that actually a way around this? Just vote on it. Um. It wouldn't be around the adding to the justices. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't work because um, them just voting on something. Maybe if they voted on this rule that I'm suggesting, they could, in that way, perhaps, um, I'm sure the court would try, I'm sure whoever part, whichever party is the best represented on the court would challenge it. But I think it might survive. The only thing that wouldn't is if, I mean, the Congress couldn't just pass a law that says all the justices at age 75 are off the court. Because that would be unconstitutional under the Constitution, clearly. But it might work. It's hard to imagine Schumer as Mitchell. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's another discussion. <laughs> right, that's another discussion. Um, I don't know, sir, if that answers your question, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> well, I guess the original um, movement from, I think it was, well, got to none, had to do with the number of, um, was it appellate courts? And now there's 13. So there's precedent. 
beliefs. Right. It had to do with the Supreme Court after the Civil War, and it didn't, they weren't effective because, in fact, the civil the uh, courts, the Supreme Court was still heavily packed at that time. That wasn't the term they would have used with Southern sympathizers. It was the whole reason why the first presidents were all from the South because the three-fifths rule, which counted slaves as only three-fifths of a person, most of us are so rebelled by that idea, repelled and rebelled, repelled by that idea that uh, we don't get further than that. But stepping aside from how awful that was to treat a person as less than a person, what it meant was the South had more slaves than they had white folks. And if they could count the slaves, even as three-fifths, they had many more representatives and electors uh, as a result of that. So they kept dominating the presidential uh, elections. OK, enough. Yes, ma'am. What are your views regarding, A, the likelihood, and B, the utility of a constitutional convention to address the ills of our democracy? Did you see the hair standing up on the back of my neck? I'm concerned about the possible likelihood because the idea is growing among citizens that that's what we need, and it's growing on both sides. However, Remember our history. This Constitution came out of a convention that was called to amend the Articles of Confederation. They met for only a few days, decided to throw all that out, and came up with a whole new Constitution. So it's an interesting precedent for our history. Uh, there are a number of proposals, the one getting the closest to uh, being uh, having a convention address is the question of um, budgeted uh, budget a a bill that limits budgets to what they can uh, I'm blanking on the word for it but really limits the Congress to appropriating only as much money as they have. Thank you. A balanced budget bill. That one has a lot of, close to enough uh, to either put out a, an amendment or even call a constitutional convention. The problem is only, even if the, the convention was called for just one purpose, as I say, we have no history that really supports that that would be successful. Um, it would inevitably devolve into all kinds of proposals. There's no, we have no idea, since this has never happened, since the one that went so badly, good, um, there are no rules for how would you elect delegates? Who would elect delegates? What would the rules be? I mean, all of that is wide open. And my fear would be, I really, really wouldn't be favorable. I don't care which party was going to make those decisions. I think it would be a disaster. Um, but you would like to think that's the appropriate answer for so many of the issues. I personally don't think it is. I think it would be um, a huge mistake. I probably won't be here to see it. Hopefully. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Yes. Is there a way to get around, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea of a lifelong, um, a lifelong limit? If um, is there a way to implement? term limits is what I really want to say. Is there, is there a way to get around that the way there's a way 
to get around that age 75? Um, well, it's not so clear. Plus, I mean, the problem with term limits, I mean, the problem with how many people go there and stay there for the rest of their career is because we vote them in. Uh, you know, Arkansas tried term limits, and it was challenged in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court struck it down and said again that the Constitution says what the terms are. Uh, the only reason they keep coming up is because the people vote them in, and so uh, it got it got ruled down by the Supreme Court. Uh, I, you know, one of the arguments against term limits, depending on how short we made them. Um, to, to say we should make the one term, um, is you get inexperienced people. Now that's the good news and bad news. Uh, it's the good news in terms of freshness, attitudes, ideas. It's the bad news in terms of government is complicated. And it is a huge bureaucracy, but it can run, it can probably never run efficiently, but it can run better under some uh, ideas and policies and administrations than in others. So I don't think there's a way around the term limits of the uh, members of Congress. Uh, well, you don't need term limits for the representatives, it's just for the senators. The representatives all stand now every two years anyway. It's really the Senate where you see mostly, there are a few exceptions in the House, but mostly it's the Senate where you see whole careers done um, as members of the Senate. And that wasn't the idea initially. You know, the whole idea initially of voting and when they didn't have all the people vote was the idea that the people in the know would know how to vote. And you weren't voting for life, you were just voting for that term and what was needed. But again, we've got a Senate that is in there for life, both sides. Um, it's the path to becoming billionaires. You were usually a billionaire when you went in, but I don't know if you saw the front page of the New York Times two days ago, I think, but they had, I can't remember the number, 87 or something like that, little pictures of members of the Congress, both the House and the, and the Senate, I think, uh, who had conflicts, who owned stocks that were affected by the committees on which they were and voted. It's not like we didn't know, but oh my god, what a picture, you know? <laughs> At any rate, I actually meant term limits for the Supreme Court justices. Uh, well, the term limits for the Supreme Court justices, again, is in the Constitution as uh, for life, for you know, under good behavior, uh, they are uh, appointments for life. And other than the suggestion I made of keeping them in the court but not having them, I don't know any other way to get around it without it being without an amendment to the Constitution. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Have I scared you all off by how long winded I am? Yes. You you thought of the other question. Yes. Um, Another question. Yeah, it's it's um, the ribbon of the first. <laughs> okay. You want him to go to the mic so you can get it? <laughs> we want to have you on you know, on camera, on TV, so you, all of your friends will know what to think of you. <laughs> I already know that. <laughs> yes. Um, let me ask it this way. What was the rationale and the legislative process that last changed the composition and number of justices? Mm -hmm. And just to put a fine point, and why couldn't that be done again? 
Civil War. Uh, and I think the number was actually changed by Lincoln just as a, an order. A lot of that was going on during the Civil War. Don't look it up. <laughs> I can hate those things. Yeah. You have a discussion at dinner and somebody is you just made a great pronouncement and somebody is just looking up and said you're all wrong. I may be wrong, but I know it was related to the Civil War and I thought Lincoln just kind of changed it and there was no real dispute because the radical Republicans were in charge of Congress and they were his party. Um, but I think it has been nine since after the Civil War. And to tell you the truth, I'm not actually quite sure why. Um, <coughs> you can look it up now but, and tell us. Well, <laughs> the, I mean, the argument to change it was to bring the, the number up to the uh, number of appellate courts, I believe. <coughs> Nine. And now there's 13. Right. Well, that's one of the good arguments. Yeah, that was 13. the rationale yeah, whenever it happened. Just not sure exactly. But it was that there were nine um, jurisdictions. And so to have um, a Supreme Court justice for each jurisdiction. Because in the early days, even before the Civil War, the justices rode circuit. You didn't have circuit court. Circuit judges had the Supreme Court judges providing the circuit. So that was the rationale. I'm just not quite sure of exactly when. But then that makes a good argument today to say there are now 13 districts. Uh, there's, uh, the court is overloaded as it is. They've gotten to where the last few years they don't decide more than 75 decisions out of over seven or 8,000 <coughs> petitions for CERN uh, because they're so overloaded. And uh, I think that um, that makes a strong argument <coughs> for adding and limiting, somewhat of, uh, of addressing the issue of workload. Uh, but uh, we still face the concern of those who like the way it is now. Yes, ma'am. Thinking about um, those billionaires and how they got there and why they are kept there, how relevant would real campaign finance reform be to changing the way judges are elevated? Well, real campaign reform, we had the makings of at least partially at one point, and the court threw that out. Um, I think real campaign reform, which really would be basically that only public monies would be uh, allocated to the candidates, that's all they could spend, not even their private sources, ain't going to happen. How relevant, question. How relevant would it be to changing things? Yeah. Come on, incredible. Okay, thank you. Incredible. Uh, at the point right now, there's just the poor schmucks like us to check yes, we'll give a dollar to the, uh, you know, the campaign finance uh, <coughs> uh, camp to, the, to the fund. Yeah. But it's just a drop in a big bucket. <coughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm just curious. I know that in state law, um, the number of members of elected committees have to be odd. Um, because if you have a tie vote, it means that you don't succeed. So I just wonder if maybe the oddity came into play in order to not just have tie votes. Um, that may have had a part of it. Again, I don't know for sure. It makes sense. Um, you know, one of the unbelievable aspects to 
McConnell's refusal to let Merrick Garland be shown, even interviewed, held up as Obama's court appointee when there was a vacancy after Scalia's death, unexpected death, um, it was too close to the next election. It was eight months to the next election. I think um, Justice Barrett, I think had a little more than eight days, um, but not much. And I suspect that Jared Garland wishes he was on the court <laughs> right now. Uh, uh, it's, it is just so ridiculous, this idea that it's too close to let the people have their say. So for eight months, the reason I got off of this, remember, for eight months, the court only had eight justices. And when the justices are even, when there's an even split, then the lower court's ruling stands. So you're right, the uneven number helps. It didn't seem to bother, however, uh, majority leader, then majority leader, Mitch McConnell um, in saying, no, no, we can't add somebody, you can't add somebody, President Obama. Um, so long. Uh, don't be sorry. What do you want to add? <laughs> uh, anyone else? I bored you out. You bored me out. Oh, I have one. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> my class and she knows yeah. she's not having another one. <laughs> well, actually, when you brought up Mitch McConnell, I was just wondering if the, um, if the majority leader has always had the power that he seems to have wielded uh, to disallow so many things to even come up for debate. Is, is, that, is, that, is that something that's always happened? No. Uh, it's certainly not something that's always happened. One of the reasons he has that power, well, there's several reasons, but one of the reasons is that the Republicans are voting in block. I mean, there's not, so when anything came up, I, what was it, it was so absurd, the giving a medal to the Capitol Police who had protected them in the insurrection. Every Republican voted against it because that's what they do. They didn't want they didn't want the Obama administration, they didn't want the Biden administration to have any wins, even when it was a win for many more people than just the party. Um, so there you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, is that do it? I mean, it's the best I can do. <laughs> you know? Yes. Speaking as someone who has not uh, taken the opportunity to attend so many of your wonderful courses that I've heard just glowing reports about, so I, I sit those out. Dipping, <laughs> <laughs> dipping the toe in rather lately, but it seems to me at the at the beginning of the evening you sort of painted a rather grim picture of the future regarding the effect of the current composition of the court and where we might be headed. Could you describe what might happen that could turn that or whether whether we should just all, I don't know, move to the Bahamas? <laughs> okay. Um, this is always my dilemma. I hate to send the class out depressed, you know, so I always try to find something at the end and put that that more or less uh, successful. What could happen, it's true that 
I'm very concerned with what this court seems absolutely prepared to do. That has me very concerned. What could turn out, I'm not supposed to say this, this is a nonpartisan group, but their speakers aren't. Um, <laughs> the, what could provide some hope is the midterm elections. If the Democrats held the House and added to the Senate seats, which the latter seems more possible than the former, uh, <coughs> then maybe this discussion of adding to the court, uh, maybe we could see some changes. Uh, I think that's the only bright spot I see at the moment <coughs> of life on Cape Cod. Um, but not Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> or Martha's Vineyard. You didn't hear about it. You'll read about it. Um, so I wish I could come up with more things. Um, <coughs> it's hard these days. I never thought in my life I would be saying some of the things I'm saying. I mean, I studied the court's history. I then studied the court's laws. And I thought, you know, we balance out, you know, the world turns and things get better. It's, uh, it's pretty And all we can do is vote and encourage all of your neighbors to vote. Maybe go out and tell some of them to vote. Make sure all your family, well, no, my family would vote the wrong way. <laughs> but that is, the vote has always been, as I said, the cornerstone of a democracy. It is the evidence that you have a democracy when there are free and fair elections, not just token elections. Um, so the fact that one of the major parties is pushing the idea that the 2020 election was rigged, that it was stolen, and we've got to make sure this next presidential election that doesn't happen, <coughs> And their ideas of how to make it, make sure it doesn't happen, are a lot of these reforms, and particularly the independent state legislature theory. Um, it's if I come up, if you give me your number, if I come up with something, <laughs> I'll broadcast it to everyone. Well, the good news, the good news will be out there. Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, hello. Well, that's your <laughs> uh, I, I just finished reading uh, Jill Lepore's book, These Truths. Uh, fabulous but dense reading. Um, and I'm left with the impression that this country has always been in turmoil. And, and I look back on my own time. Um, say the late 60s and early 70s when I was in the service, I thought it was, the, you know, I thought it was the end of our country. I mean, you know, it's just terrible. <clears throat> and now I look back to, at Nixon as just a petty crook. <laughs> so, you know, things were pretty good back then compared to now. And I, and I just wonder if it hasn't always been this way. Well, Jill Lacourt is a fabulous historian, writer, uh, commentator, you're right, it's not slim books, but she's fabulous. And it's true that this country has always been in turmoil. In fact, it's true that this country has always been violent. That's not necessarily <coughs> taught, but it has always been violent. To some people, for some people more than others, but this is not new. What President Biden calls hate-filled violence, or he gave a talk with today and was using some, but 
Violence is always hate-filled. I mean, it's rape is hate-filled. I mean, so, and we have had a lot of violence. One of the things that I think would be maybe hopeful, she's back there. Yes, yes. <laughs> We need to address education in this country. We used to teach civics. I mean, it's terrifying that reporters can stand on Fifth Avenue in New York and ask, I don't know, how many people, but only a third of them can name the three branches. Um, so education is one place where if we would get smart and start investing our monies in education, in particularly those schools no. in the inner cities no. where they're terribly run and underfunded, not terribly run, under free, but underfunded for sure. If we would start to accept things in our history, like the 1619 Project, which describes really when this country began for blacks, all be slaves, um, if we would start to recognize that we're not, you know, we're not the greatest countries on this earth. From my mind, it's the country I am most glad that my genetic pool landed me here, even in Texas. But, uh, but we're not. When you travel, you realize how much other cultures have to offer, how much there is out there mm -hmm. that they do so much better than we're doing, at least right now. So I take your point, I take her point. What worries me is a little <coughs> bit different this time is maybe before the Civil War, but I can't think of any other time where the parties were so divided, where, you know, the grand old party, what happened to the grand old party? I mean, there's the loyal opposition. That is the theory under the two-party system. Maybe we need a third party. The problem is every time it's been tried, um, it ends up hurting one of the opponents more than the other, and instead of having the balance that you're hoping it provides, it doesn't. But I think if we could, if we could get a third party that would that could become prominent enough, um, but we have always been in turmoil. I mean, those of you, I know you're not old enough, but those of you who lived through World War II. And we thought, you know, that was incredible turmoil, incredible fear of what was going to happen if the Germans succeeded in Europe. Um, you know, I mean, I thought we were in a terrible turmoil until the Red Sox finally won the World Series. <laughs> 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 but I don't mean to make light of it. It's true. We've always been in turmoil. What's different right now is how one of the parties is absolutely voting strictly on party lines against anything the other party tries, and vice versa, perhaps. Um, that that makes it almost impossible to do what you have to do in Congress and the Senate. Compromise, as they always keep saying, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, I had another head. Yes, yes. I hope I can speak about it now. Okay. Um, there's some, some thought that we be behind the choices of thinking, legal motivation is kind of ideology. Do you agree with that, that it might be, and particularly a religious ideology that was motivating the tourists mm -hmm. and their interpretations of that? The Supreme Court's ideology 
interesting. You know, the current court, actually before Katanya Brown Jackson came on, although I think she's Catholic, but I'm not sure. Before she came on, the court consisted of six Catholics and three Jews, none of which would have been true um, a number of years ago. But there wasn't the feel then that so much was ideologically driven because they weren't always on the same side. I think, in my opinion, the current court, which is now um, <coughs> seven Catholics and one Jew and Maybe one Unitarian, that doesn't count as a religion. Episcopalian. Uh, <laughs> what Will Rogers used to say. Um, I think there's no question that what seems to be driving, there's no question that this Supreme Court has never seen a religious case they didn't love. I mean, every time that something comes along. Um, what I feel is happening is that there is this, not just the court, but there's this drive to return to a male-dominated white yeah. Protestant yeah. nation. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's not necessarily true of the court, uh, but I think uh, Catholicism has always had a strong influence in this country, as it has in Europe. Um, and I don't like to attribute religion to the judge's decisions and thinking because I don't think it is all the same, but I do believe there is this thrust right now and uh, it's the fear of white people not being the dominant population, so we're losing to <coughs> Uh, that's crazy. This was always a country of immigrants. We were always Heinz, 57 varieties. Um, but I do think that's part of what the fear is, and it's the reason they want to suppress votes by the new rising citizen numbers that aren't white Anglo Protestant. <coughs> Um, but it's more complicated than that. I, I don't think you can really just, I can't really just say it's the, uh, it's all their religious philosophy. I do think religion plays a part in what's happening in America. <laughs> but it isn't necessarily just one religion. Um, yes, ma'am. I don't know what that did I yeah. how do you think that the Dobbs decision uh, is mixed in with that? I mean I think that's more Catholic. I'm Catholic by background, okay? But I think that that's straight Catholicism. The Dobbs decision of of, um, of abortion not even in the case of rape or incest. Well, I think the Dobbs decision Certainly, positions, many positions on abortion are driven by religion on both sides. But I think the Dobbs decision by this court was as much about male dominance, female subservience, as it is about abortion. And I think that's the really frightening part. I mean, I hate to see 50 years of a right taken away. It is the first right the court has ever taken back. And so why is this? The uppity women. <laughs> yes, sir. Here's a question of the woman up here, the big one voters. Yeah. What are they saying in terms of 
national registration. The legal women voters growing nationally. Do you know? Uh, it did before the 2020 election. What's happening now? I don't know. Okay, we do have to because the library needs to return this. <coughs> Mary Francis. Yeah. <laughs>